Hey, can we give it up for Meredith one more time? What a blessing to have her with us this morning. <clears throat> hey, my name's Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're incredibly grateful to have each and every one of you with us today, especially if this is your first time joining us. Uh, thanks for coming and being a part of this gathering. This is just a small part of what we do as a church, and so if you decide to keep coming back, just know that three things we'd like for you to do is consider getting in a group and serving on a team and also finding ways to invest in the next generation. Uh, in this way, we feel like we can fulfill a deeper purpose together. Uh, well, guys, I want to talk to the men in the room really quick uh, because coming up on October 25th through the 27th, we have our first ever men's retreat. And so, guys, I want to talk to you really quick, and specifically, I want to give you three reasons why I think that you need to be a part of this particular retreat. The first thing is, as guys, and you know this, sometimes we need to meet together. Sometimes we need to talk about the things that we're specifically challenged with, and we need to figure out how to approach those things and battle those things with our arms locked together. The second reason why I think you need to be a part of this is because sometimes I think we need other men in our life to encourage us, specifically other men who want to follow Jesus, to encourage encourage us, and when needed, sometimes even punch us in the chest and hold us accountable. The last reason why I think that you would want to be or you need to be a part of this men's retreat is because oftentimes, guys, in the day-to-day -day grind of our life, there's something that begins to go dormant in us that I think God created within us. You see, I think God created within us a desire to fight a desire to fight for our marriages, to fight for our kids, to fight for the Lord, and to fight other battles that he deems necessary. But what happens in our day-to-day -day grind is we have a tendency to suppress that warrior inside of us that God put inside of us to fight the necessary battles in our life. And so sometimes I believe it's good for us to kind of get away, and whether that's in nature or something else, to be reminded of the things that maybe we have been suppressing that God wants to revive. And so uh, if you want to sign up for that, you can go to our website today, tracechurch.com. You'll see a little tab on there that says Men's Retreat, and we would encourage you to sign up for that. Well, today we're continuing in this series called Killing What's Killing Me, and last week we talked about screens, and we specifically talked about how uh, we need to have some healthy boundaries when it comes to the screens in our life and how we can redeem the screen. And then we, uh, if you were a parent and you had a kid in our Trace Kids ministry, uh, they created a box for you that said, I'm worth it, that you were supposed to be putting your phones in this week. How many of you guys got held accountable by your kid this week? Anybody? Yeah, one of my kids uh, actually saw me maybe using technology when I shouldn't have been and said, oh, I guess you don't have to listen to your own sermon. <laughs> She's grounded for two weeks. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, guys, over the next couple of weeks, I think we're going to be tackling some pretty big subjects, and I want to encourage you to keep coming back. Uh, and over the next two weeks, we're going to be looking at the comparison trap and how when we continue, uh, continue to compare our lives to the lives of others, that it has a tendency to kind of take us away from God's purpose and calling in our life and in your life. And then we're going to be concluding this series by looking at the subjects of anxiety and worry. And I don't think I need to tell you this. I don't need to convince you of this. But this is something that's truly, it's plaguing the human spirit. And not that we're going to be able to like conclude that, you know, that day with all the right answers, but it's definitely something that we need to talk about. But for our time today, what we're going to attempt to do is we're going to attempt to crash the chatterbox and learn to hear God's voice above all the others. And probably the quick question coming right after that, which is, what is the chatterbox? The chatterbox is that voice in our heads that is often transmitted through our thoughts, and it feeds off things like insecurity and shame and condemnation and fear. Maybe the first thing that I would encourage you to do this morning is to look at these four areas and determine where is the chatterbox the loudest in your life. A little bit later in our time together this morning, I'm going to confess to you what the area of struggle is for me, and maybe it will prompt you to continue to go further yourself. Now, I'll be honest. This is a big subject. As I was preparing the sermon for this week, I quickly understood that there's no way that I'm going to be able to unpack today everything that I would like to. This is not going to be an exhaustive sermon on this subject. And so as we get to the end of our time today, if you feel like you would like to go a step further, I would encourage you to pick up the book actually entitled Crash the Chatterbox by Pastor Stephen Furtick. And so you can do that. But knowing that there was no way that we're going to be able to cover everything that I would like to today, what I did determine is that there are three things specifically that I would like to make sure that we can walk away with. Number one is an awareness. An awareness that this chatterbox does exist in all of our lives. And an awareness in those four areas that I showed you a moment ago, maybe an awareness for you which one of those is the loudest in your life. Because 
oftentimes it's awareness that allows us to begin the process of healing. But in this particular situation, it's awareness that will allow us to know how to battle against the specific area that the chatterbox is the loudest for you. The second thing that I want to accomplish today is to help you to learn how to hear God's voice above all the other voices in our life. And the third thing that I'd like to accomplish today is to make sure that we're being proactive, to encourage you, I should say, encourage you to make sure that we're being proactive in capturing and taking captive all the thoughts that are rotating through our minds, both the good thoughts and the bad thoughts. And the reason this is so important, friends, is because the voice that you believe, the voice that you believe will determine the future that you experience. The voice that you believe will determine the future that you experience. Now, let me preface this particular sermon with a little bit of theology so that you have a more accurate understanding this morning of what I'm not saying and what I am trying to say. You see, it's possible that when I've already described what the chatterbox is, what we may have a tendency to do is immediately associate that voice with Satan, as if it's actually Satan being the one who's speaking to us when we're hearing that chatterbox and those voices of discouragement and that false narrative that we're attempting to believe about ourselves and others. So I want to do something really quick. Again, just a little bit of theology. I want to make sure that we know who Satan is and who he isn't and what he is capable of and what he isn't capable of. So let's talk about this for a second. First, Satan is not omnipotent like God is, which means he's not all-powerful. So he can't control your life, including your brain. He's not omnipresent like God is, meaning he isn't everywhere at once. So he doesn't live like around our lives all the time and know exactly what's happening with us. He's not omniscient like God is, which means all-knowing. And that means he does not know your every thought. Don't miss this. We have to remember that Satan is God's enemy, but he is not God's equal. Let me remind you of 1 John chapter 5. It says this, We know that God's, as God's children... We do not make a practice of sinning, for God's Son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. We know that we are children of God, and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. But if the Spirit of God lives in us, then we are set aside from that. You, dear children, in 1 John chapter 4, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you, the one who is in you, is greater than the one who is in the world. So church, I'm here to remind you this morning that if the Spirit of God lives in you, then Satan, he can't touch you. He can't control you. And therefore, he can't force us to think in a certain way. Now, stay with me. Because that doesn't mean he isn't involved in the process of the chatterbox. Here's how I want to describe it. All of us throughout our lives have had exposure to sin and evil. Some of us have been directly involved in sin and in evil. And it's because of our involvement at times and even our experience with sin and evil, even though we now have the Spirit of God in us, for those of us that have put Jesus as the Lord and leader of our life, that influence is still affecting us today, especially our thoughts. And it's that little voice. This is where it leads to the chatterbox. That leads to that little voice. It's this root of evil and sin that has influence in our life that leads to this chatterbox that is breeding within us insecurity, and shame, and condemnation, and fear, all of which do not come from God. Now, it's also possible that when I've described a chatterbox to you, maybe you didn't immediately associate it with Satan. Maybe you associated it with yourself. In other words, oftentimes the chatterbox sounds a lot like you, doesn't it? Oftentimes, the chatterbox sounds a lot like your voice. And I mean, if we were to think about this, it's a little easier, a little easier at times to actually put up a defense or know how to battle an outside accusation that is coming at us. But when that voice sounds a lot like us, it's a little bit more convincing. (laughs) I'm so stupid. I'll never be good enough. I'm not worthy of something or someone like that. I'm failing. I'm a failure. I'll never be as good of a preacher as they are. I don't have what it takes to be that good of a mom. Maybe they can, come, maybe they can overcome that addiction, but I'm too weak. Remember what happened last time? I can't trust anyone. Friends, I believe most of us are like the rest of us. And because most of us are like the rest of, it, rest of us, when it comes to how we view ourselves, I think oftentimes we struggle with a mentality of scarcity. It's what we don't have enough of. 
Maybe I could just explain it in this way. I'm never blank enough. Now, I want some crowd participation this morning, and I'm giving you permission to be human today. I'm going to be human today, and so I want to give you permission to be human. So how would you fill in that blank? I'm never what? And we'll have, like, we'll have awkward silence if we need to because I want to hear from you today. I'm never what? Enough. Good? Good. Smart? Strong? What was it? Motivated? What else? I'm never patient. Skinny. I missed it. Smart. Somebody said rich last service. It's an honest answer. Charles Spurgeon, many would argue, is one of the greatest theologians who ever lived, and he offered this advice. Beware of no man more than yourself. We carry our own worst enemies within us. There was another great theologian of our day who said this. (laughs) I'm losing myself. I'm stuck in the moment. I look in the mirror, my only opponent. You know why this conversation is so important? Because the voice you believe will determine the future that you experience. And so you're either going to believe the voice of the adversary. Again, it's not necessarily Satan speaking to you himself, but it's his influence in this world that has taken its root in our lives to some extent that still allow it to feed that chatterbox that's feeding us a false narrative about who you're not. But he's trying to convince you that you are. So we're either listening to that voice from the adversary or we're going to listen to our advocate, which is another name for the Holy Spirit. And the answer is easy there, right? It's an easy answer. Of course we want to listen to the voice of God. Of course we want to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But maybe the obvious next question is, how do we recognize the voice of God? How do we know when it's God directing our thoughts? How do we know when it's the chatterbox? Or how do we know we just didn't have some bad reaction to kale? Is there a good reaction to kale? That is a question worth asking. To begin to answer this, I actually want to go to John's gospel and look in chapter 10 and let you hear from Jesus himself. He says this, the gatekeeper, which is himself, he's referring to himself. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice, and they come to him, and he calls his own sheep. And by the way, he's referring to you and I when he's referring to sheep, which is kind of insulting because sheep are stupid. It's like, Couldn't we have been like llamas or something? But it's Jesus, so he can call us whatever he wants. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them. Imagery, just imagine it. He walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his what? His voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Do you know how we recognize voices that should be strange voices? you know how we recognize stranger voices? Voices in our mind by making sure we know what voice we should be listening for. Church, one of the things that I believe to be critical to the Christian life is learning to recognize the voice of God above all others, which also means, listen to me, which also means we need to know what God wouldn't say to us, right? God doesn't breed fear, which is why we see the phrase fear not over 300 times in the Bible. God doesn't guide with guilt, which is why you need to know the saving grace of his son Jesus. God doesn't remind us of who we were and what we've done. He tells us who we are because of what Christ did. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul tells us this. This means that anyone, everybody say anyone, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone and a new life has begun. And all of this... It's a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Don't miss this last line. No longer counting people's sins against them. Thank you, Jesus. The chatterbox loves to remind you of what you've done. The chatterbox loves to bring your past back into the present. Another way that I could say that is the chatterbox uses your history to inform your insecurity. This is why I think it's so important that we live and that we lead lives 
with transparency and vulnerability and confession. Maybe more the most important part of that is confession because it's just one way that we can disarm and quiet our enemy and begin to crash the chatterbox. And so if you struggle in these areas, if you struggle being vulnerable, if you struggle with transparency, if you struggle making confessions where you need to, I just need to let you know today that this is going to be a more difficult area for you than it is for most. I learned a long time ago that I don't want to hide from my brokenness I want to lead with my brokenness. So in the spirit of that and in the spirit of transparency this morning, let me tell you where I struggle when it comes to the chatterbox. I thought it was insecurity. And not that I don't struggle with insecurity, but I thought that was my greatest one. But after spending some time with the Lord this week, I learned that it's actually not insecurity, it's fear. And oftentimes the chatterbox shows up with that focus, I shouldn't say focus, with that um, issue of fear in my life. And it sounds something like this, I'm going to fail at something. I can't be a good father, husband, and a pastor. I'm going to drop the ball. One of these is going to suffer. I'm going to fail. My chatterbox often likes to bring my past back into the present and says things like this. You can't trust them. Or Again, in first person, I can't trust you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I can't trust you. I can't trust them. They don't have my best interest in mind. They have impure motives. And when I begin to believe the chatterbox in this area, what I begin to do is assign false motives onto people without really any merit to go off of. And friends, that has led me to sometimes look at the worst in people. And I hate this about myself, which is why this subject is so important. But now, I know. Now I know that this is a struggle, and I know that that's not the voice from my Heavenly Father. And so what I've begun to do is begin to figure out how do I battle against that. Now I know. I know that's not my Father's voice, because I can recognize my Father's voice because I spend time with Him. And so God has given me this exercise, and if you struggle with trust issues, I'm going to share this with you today, because I promise you this will be beneficial for you. And it's a little exercise that I go through in my attempt to battle my chatterbox, and it goes something like this. All of us have expectations in this life. I have different expectations with my wife than I would my kids, than I would the people who work for me, but nonetheless, I have expectations. And so what happens if you have trust issues, and this is, you know, fear is your area of focus, what happens is I will expect things from people, but oftentimes I will experience something different. And what I have a tendency to do, and what you would likely have a tendency to do if you struggle in this area, is when you expect something, but you experience something different, when you experience something different than what you expected, you will fill this gap right here with suspicion before you fill it with trust. And I've learned that about myself. When I expect, when I experience something different than what I expected, I will fill that gap with suspicion before I will fill it with trust. And I'm learning to combat that. I'm learning to battle that, and for what it's worth, I'm not sure that battle will ever go away. There's a reason why I have these issues, and this is, this is not going to be therapy for me today, so I'm not going to go into all of that, but there's a reason why trust is a big issue for me in my life, and so this may be a battle that I'll face for the rest of your life. Whatever yours is, whatever out of those four categories, that may be a battle that you face for the rest of your life, and the Bible would call this a stronghold, and so you're going to have to learn how to battle ongoing that stronghold. Let me show you what Paul says about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and who he says you are. And we take captive. I love this I love this statement. And we take captive every thought, every thought, to make it obedient to Christ. Now, if you grew up in the church, you've likely heard this verse before. And what you'll have a tendency to do, and I bet you've had a tendency to do in the past, is when you hear this passage, your mind immediately goes to negative thoughts. That you need to take negative thoughts captive. You need to capture negative thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. And you absolutely need to do that. When your thoughts don't line up with who God says you are, that's the chatterbox. And you need to capture that thought, and you need to learn how to kill it. When your thoughts take you away from the life that God has called you to live, you need to capture it, and you need to replace it with the promises and the purposes God has for you. But I also want you to read this for exactly what it says, because it says take every thought captive, including the good ones. You see, I believe our Father 
is trying to help you to combat the chatterbox by speaking truth into your life. You are good enough. You do have what it takes. There isn't nothing. There's nothing in your life that would dismiss you from my love. I am with you. I am for you. You are a child of mine. Don't believe those lies. And so when we're hearing from our Father, who is trying to feed us thoughts to help us to combat the chatterbox, we need to take those thoughts captive as well. We need to capture them and remember the promises that our Father is giving us from heaven. Our thoughts, if you don't know this, our thoughts are to our soul as food is to our body. I don't think we think about our thoughts enough. But you still may be asking, how do I know? How do I know if it's from God? I don't want to say it's simple, okay? I don't want to say it's simple. But it might be more simple than you think. When wondering if those thoughts that you're hearing are, again, maybe it's, it's never been audible for me, so it's those thoughts that kind of just kind of come up and I can hear them in first person. And sometimes I wonder, is that thought from the Lord? And one of the easiest ways to discern that is to know if they're coming from his word and if they're full of wisdom. Are they coming from his word, and are they full of wisdom? Probably one of the best ways to recognize the voice of God in your life is by knowing his word, which is why you need to be in his word. For those of you that don't know our Bible study method called D1, uh, we'd love to teach it to you, and so if that's something you're interested in, we'd love to sit down with you and talk to you about that. But let me make a caveat here, because God's word is not exhaustive. Stay with me. It's not exhausted, which means sometimes you have to use wisdom. But wisdom will never nullify nor negate the word of God. Here's a perfect example. In, when we read God's word, never will we read these words, don't live with your boyfriend or girlfriend. But in Ephesians 5, Paul says not to have even a hint of sexual immorality. So what is the wise thing to do? to not move in with your boyfriend or girlfriend. And if you're here today right now and you're living with your boyfriend or girlfriend, I'm not here to cast judgment. No, I'm not leading with this to make you feel guilty. But I love you enough to let you know that it's not the wise thing to do. Paul says not even a hint of sexual immorality. So as you're discerning these voices and thoughts, you need to know that God will always back up his thoughts with his word and through wisdom that comes from him through his word and through wisdom. But you also need to know this, and maybe you do know this, and I turned 40 this year, and so sometimes I wonder if this is just an old age thing uh, or if this is just something that happens to most of us. And here's what I mean by that. Oftentimes when I feel like God is giving me something, he's giving me a word, he's giving me a thought, he's giving me something, a promise that he wants me to soak in, my mind will lose it quickly. Have you ever noticed this? And I don't know if it's because I'm 40 or that's just like, part of the process of walking with Jesus, because I'm reminded also of John chapter 10, when it says, we do have an enemy that came to steal and kill and destroy, meaning when God is giving you his promises, the chatterbox in that moment wants to overcome, he wants to be louder. Right when you're on the edge of a breakthrough, right when you're on the edge of overcoming whatever the obstacle is in your life, I believe the chatterbox is going to be the loudest that it will ever be. And you need to remember that there's an enemy that's attempting to steal, kill, and destroy. The chatterbox is a thief, which is why it is so essential that you know who you are in Christ and you know whose you are. Because as God is trying to tell you who you are in him, that you're a child of his, as God is trying to speak into your life identity, the devil's trying to tell you who you're not. And that influence often comes through the way of the chatterbox. So I want you to lean in in what I'm going to tell you next. When you're reminded of God's grace, whether it's through a song that Meredith Andrew leads, Andrews leads us through, whether it's through a sermon, whether it's through your own personal time with the Lord, when you're reminded of the grace of God and how God loves you just as he found you, capture it and crush the chatterbox when it says you aren't worthy of God's love or you can't be forgiven because of something that you've done. When you read in Romans 8 that the same spirit and the same power that raised Jesus from the grave lives in you, capture it and use it, to, use it against the chatterbox that says, you can't overcome this, you're too weak. When the chatterbox says, you don't have what it takes, you're not enough, I want you to capture Ephesians 3.20 
when Paul says, now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than what I could ever ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within me. And this last one is huge. If you ever even remotely begin to believe that there's anything about your life, whether in the present or whether in the past, that scares Jesus off, I want you to remember Romans 8, 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, including your biggest mistake and your greatest regret, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can I get an amen this morning? Jesus said, my sheep, they're going to listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So this morning, I want to remind you to use his word and to use wisdom, to learn to listen for his voice above all the others. And when you hear it, capture it and follow it, because the voice you believe will determine the future that you experience. I'm going to pray for us. Father, again, this is a big subject, and Lord, I think that this can go so deep in our minds and affect our hearts and souls sometimes, depending on our past and depending on what we're carrying with us, that there may be some people in here that actually need to go to counseling for this, and God, I pray that you would prompt them and give them the courage to do that. That would be healthy. For those of us that are still wrestling with this, maybe we would need you to help us to identify where is the area where the chatterbox shows up the most in our life. And God, help us to give us tools and give us people and help us to rely on your word to make sure that we're combating the chatterbox, God, that we are capturing thoughts, both the negative thoughts that we need to talk, take captive and make them obedient to you and capturing the thoughts that you're whispering to us as our Father in heaven and that we will we'll hold on to those promises and we'll use them as ammunition to overcome the chatterbox in our life. Father, I pray that this is not something that we would dismiss. God, I don't think we think about our thoughts enough. And so, God, I pray that this would be something that you would just ingrain in the minds of everybody in this room to spend more time on. Maybe this is a reminder that we need to be in your word more often. Maybe this is a reminder that you do have promises that you have given us that we need to know and re really need to have in memorization so that we can use them immediately to combat the chatterbox in our life. And so, Father, I pray for your help, your guidance, your Holy Spirit's movement in and through this room and the people in this room to continue to spend time in this subject to make sure that we're listening to your voice above all others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.